Okay. No. Okay, great. So I wanted to show you the, the final of that last case before we go to our next case. Yeah. You can see here, if they can show you the IVIS, uh, we did exactly what you had suggested and, and uh, Tomas has, and Dr. Zeller had, had suggested. You can see the intravascular ultrasound shows a very, very complex dissection um, at the level of we the- We cannot uh, see the ultrasound. Can we show the ultrasound, guys? Yeah, now, now we can see okay. the ultrasound. It shows a very, very complex dissection of the, of the proximal SFA uh, leading all the way up to the ostium. So at this time, uh, because of uh, really multiple adventitial injury that you can see, we really felt that scaffolding was going to be necessary in order to get the best possible result. So very quickly, I'm just going to show you here. This is the dissection that you just saw, Ivist. And then what we did was we went ahead and, and we placed a stent. Once we placed a, a stent, a bare metal stent here, we used the Abbott. Uh, what's the Abbott? Absolute Pro, excuse me guys, I just know Sapera. Absolute Pro uh, at the proximal to really uh, hit the uh, ostium without, without uh, going into the common femoral. And then you can see distal, we just post dilated with a six millimeter balloon. And, and you can see we have excellent flow all, all the way down into the foot with, without really using a scaffold other than in the proximal area. So I think this is again, three vessel runoff all the way down to the foot. So I think that this was a great example of, um, of, a, of a case with a complex SFA where multimodality therapy, including atherectomy, DCB, and, uh, and with the help of adjunctive IVUS, uh, using, using spot stenting really took a long, a long lesion and really kind of treated it with, the, with just a short stent. So I wanted to just show you some completion on that, and we've got a great uh, brachycephalic case right now to show you. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, Case, uh, and uh, it was probably a few years ago in uh, such a case uh, you ended the case uh, with a full metal jacket uh, and uh, today it is possible really to implant or stent uh, in a length of two to four centimeters. Okay. So, uh, so, so we have a now we would like to see you in the cat lab. Uh, yep. You are really very fast. We, well, we're right here, and uh, we, we, we have a presentation uh, to make here. And uh, if you put up the slides, guys, uh, we, we can start with uh, the presentation. There you go. go ahead. So I just wanted to just introduce the team, just the nurses who are new. Uh, we have Ashley in the back and Elizabeth and Marich, who's joined us again for this case, but the same team. Go ahead, Farhan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So um, next slide. So this is a 64-year-old male with a history of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. The patient has a history of PAD, has had a left SFA stent, and as well as left carotid artery disease, and has had a left CCA, ICA stent as well. Uh, the patient has an extensive history of coronary artery disease, status post-cabbage. He has a Lima to LAD, SVG to the diagonal, SVG to the OM1 and OM2, and SVG to the RPDA. The patient now presents with a class four angina he um, uh, that's been going on for the last couple of weeks. Uh, he underwent a nuclear stress test at his uh, cardiologist's office and the patient was found to have severe anterior and apical myocardial ischemia with an ejection fraction of 45%. Uh, he was referred for a cardiac catheterization. Uh, as you can see, that's the patient's past medical history which we've gone over. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, he's on appropriate medications, including aspirin and Plavix. He's on four antianginals. Um, however, he continues to have uh, pain at rest. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, his examination reveals that his uh, right arm blood pressure is 130 over 84, and his uh, left arm blood pressure is 90 over 60. Otherwise, uh, exam is unremarkable. Uh, his laboratory data is all within normal limits. You can see his nuclear stress test that reveals anterior and apical myocardial ischemia that's severe. Next slide. So this was the angiogram that was done, and I, uh, just for time's sake, I just put the most important picture, which is uh, the injection of the left subclavian. You can see there's severe proximal left subclavian stenosis with a possible dissection and uh, ulceration. You can see the IMA filling there. Next slide. So the patient's cardiac catheterization reveals severe native three-vessel coronary artery disease. Uh, the, the lima was patent, however, the proximal uh, left subclavian uh, was jeopardized, uh, stenosis was jeopardizing lima flow into the LAD. The other graphs were all patent. Uh, 
at this point, we actually did a CTA of the neck and chest, and the patient was found to have uh, proximal left subclavian stenosis with a focal Sorry, dissection. Easy, easy, easy. His left, uh, uh, left uh, CCA and ICA stents easy. were patent, and he has a patent uh, sure, left sure. vertebral and right vertebral. Next slide. So this is a CT uh, of the measurements of the subclavian, Flush. and you can see that proximal to the uh, stenosis, the patient's uh, left subclavian measures around, uh, around 6.7 to 7 uh, millimeters in diameter, and then distal to the stenosis, there's, uh, uh, it measures around 10.3 and then subsequently narrows as it turns. Next slide. So uh, in conclusion, this is a 64-year-old male with a history of diabetes, hypertension, hypolipidemia, has extensive per, uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and now presents with class 4 angina and a severe um, uh, defect on his uh, stress test that reveals anterior ischemia. Uh, his uh, angiogram reveals a left, uh, proximal left subclavian stenosis, jeopardizing the IMA graft, and the plan is to perform left subclavian intervention. Okay. So um, I just wanted to go over uh, what we've done so far, obviously, for, for the sake of time. So I, again, for everybody out there, like Dr. Collins said, it's important to do an arch aortogram. And so we did an arch aortogram with just very little dye. And you can see here, he has a, just about a type 2 arch here, but so uh, making uh, engagement a little bit difficult. So what we had to do was we went with a vertebral tip catheter, uh, and, then, and then we used an 014 wire. Uh, to cross the lesion because it was very difficult to actually track it across. And then we had to use two 014 wires across it, and then we're able to track our vertebral tip catheter across this. Uh, and then again, you can see it's distal. Uh, track the vertebral catheter across this carefully, and then change out for an 035 uh, uh, heavy duty wire like a super core. Obviously, we checked our position to make sure we didn't uh, create any damage with the 014 wires. Then we tracked the, uh, our, our seven French uh, uh, cook uh, uh, destination sheet up to this level and just took one picture. And so the patient has had active angina. And you can see here that the lima is, is patent, but you can see this tremendous competitive flow. So what we decided to do is we, he's on heparin. You can see the vertebral artery is open, but he does have the uh, contralateral vertebral, which is dominant and is also, is also patent all the way to the brain. So the CT uh, makes us feel comfortable. So our plan now is to do angioplasty and stenting. But the one question we wanted to talk to you about is how would you deal with the, with the size discrepancy uh, in the vessel where you have 10 uh, uh, closer to the lima and uh, around 7 proximal uh, to the, uh, or near the ostium of the subclavian. So just to, while you guys talk, I'm just going to go ahead and balloon this with a 7 millimeter balloon. So Prakash, uh, Dr. Wiley gave us a very eloquent presentation on uh, radial access for brachycephalic interventions. When, what, under what circumstances would you come from the wrist oh, instead of the uh, instead of the femoral access? Uh, you know, Peter. You know, we've really rarely ever done radial access for subclavians. Um, I just feel that when we hit the ostium, it's been very difficult for us to know where the ostium is. I mean, the views we, the standard views we always use, uh, a little die here, guys, have been areocranial to, to really look at, look at the, uh, uh, the, the relation of the lima versus the vert. That's good. Let's go up here. Lima versus the vert. And the second is we've always used our LAO caudal to, to identify the ostium. So right now, as you can see here, we're in the areocranial view, which is showing me where the lima takeoff is, and we're well proximal to it. I'm just going to have a little bit of uh, the, uh, the balloon inside the stand, or maybe even walk the sheath back slightly with Dr. Guja's help. He has a very difficult groin, as you can imagine. Watch the, yeah, there you go. All right, go up now, guys. So one yep. of the problems, Peter, with go. doing uh, go radio stenting of the subclavian is that you have the wind blowing in your face. So no. even when you do come from the radio, Go you up. can't properly identify uh, anatomy, and you will even sometimes do a femoral approach just so okay. that you That's can good. see so what you're doing. But since nobody answered your Five, question, uh, seven, PK, um, how do you deal with the size discrepancy? Dumb. You have a tight stenosis. Most likely you have a postpanotic dilatation, and you should absolutely mm -hmm. not size this to the 10-millimeter diameter that uh, I don't believe many humans have 10 millimeter subclavian arteries. So that would be an absolute mistake, as I'm sure you know. But uh, you would size it to your uh, smaller vessel, and you can always go bigger, but not smaller. I, I agree with you, Steve. The one other thing I'd do here is consider a 40 millimeter length balloon and take a picture with the contralateral cranial there and then switch views to the LAO. So the question is going to be can you use a 38 millimeter covered stent? 
And, you know, the, uh, so that to me is helpful using a longer balloon and get a sense is 38 going to cover the bird or not in two views. Why would you use a covered stem? <coughs> because the uh, rates are so low. And so, so they're relatively low. Two reasons here, Steve. If it's significantly dissected and calcified, I might think of going. They don't have to. And your, your point is like, yeah. well, I think you might consider having a cover scent. So the cover scent would be your bailout. So if you were to have a, a rupture, then you'd want to use a covered stent. So it'd be another reason not to use the, the radio because the, the size is going to see or being able to get a covered stent in would require a bigger, a bigger sheath or, or guiding catheter. So, so Ty, I guess, uh, you know, all those reasons were the reasons we decided to go um, groin. Even though the, it was a very, very difficult groin, he has a severe peripheral arterial disease. We had to get a seven French sheath in to have our bailouts in place. But uh, the nice thing I wanted to demonstrate today is we decided to go with a covered stent just the way you said because of this eccentric calcium. Uh, you saw in the CAT scan, and I think that's where this pre-op workup is really going to help us uh, to really know, you know, how much calcium we're dealing with. Can you cycle a cuff pressure, guys? So, so you, you can see here that, that we chose this Gore, a Gore VBX stent. And this VBX stent is really a nice stent because you, you're able to dilate uh, one part of it. So basically, we decided to go with an 8-millimeter balloon, an uh, 8-millimeter stent, uh, and we can take this all the way up to 11. So, so, so we can actually dilate part of the stent, like the proximal part of the stent, out to 11, and the distal part of the stent keep it an 8. So we're able to match it to the vessel, um, and it's also a very flexible stent. Uh, they're studying the iliacs, and they've also, you, there are some uh, case reports of having it done in the SFA. It shows that it's very flexible, although this is not an area where you'd worry about a lot of compression of the subclavian here. But, but uh, so in this, in this area, we're going to use the two views. The only other thing that I think is important for the audience to remember is that it's a seven French compatible. So once I place this, I'm not going to be able to really puff around it to see whether I've covered the lima or not. So I'm going to ask Michelle to, to put us on roadmap, and I'm just going to go ahead and just give a little puff here to see. Sir, just relax. Go ahead. So this is going to tell me where my lima is. You can see now I have integrated flow of my lima. Now I'm just going to go ahead, and my goal here is I know I don't have much osteal disease. I really don't want to cover that lima, so I'm just going to go up this way, all the way in. And again, it's, it's a, like I said, a seven French device. I don't know if you guys have used it. We really um, have had some nice success with complex cases with this stent. And you can see here, it's tracking quite well up to that level. And I'm just going to kind of park it right there. If you guys are happy with that, I don't know how you feel. Uh, we're, we're proximal to the lima, and we're not quite at the osteum. Maybe we can puff a little. Let's see whether we can squeeze a little bit out of this. So at least I know proximally I'm okay if I don't move the stent. So now I'm just going to give a little bit of dye here, a little dye. Prakash, how what is how the long is this stent? This is a 29, Dr. Biamonino. This is a 29 stent. And I don't think we have much osteal disease. So I'm just going to take a picture here. taking a picture one of the nice things about so now i'm not worried about the ostium at all i'm actually very very happy with the distal i don't know what do you guys think are you guys happy with that distal oh, i like it yeah i think it's good and i'm just going to go to this view to check my ostium i know i'm going to miss the ostium pk this another Sorry. question that the ct Sorry. results are kind of interesting so he has hmm. complex lesion there it looks like it's calcified oh. that he has dissection Wait. too why do you think he has dissection uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think I, I, we, we were initially thinking this is a, maybe a clamp injury is what I was initially thinking. It looks like a penetrating ulcer. That's but look, or now it could maybe a penetrating ulcer. So I think covering it is a good idea. But I kind of like my position here, Ty and Dr. Jenkins and the whole panel. What do you guys think of this? So I, this PK, is, you uh, could bring it back a little bit. I think you should yeah, cover the last I, I, I was going to say I pull it back a little bit, PK. If okay. You, if you make Just it a couple there. millimeters. All right, let's try it. Let's try it. That's why I got you guys to help me with this tough one. If you misplace it because you're using a covered stent, you certainly don't want to misplace it distal. Get a little die. It would go. be okay to misplace it proximal. I think there's a lesion there that once you dilate this stent, you're not going to be happy. There you go. I like that one a lot yeah. better, Bill. Yeah, I agree. Yep, that's a great idea. I think we're going to go up here, guys. So anyway, for anticoagulation purposes, so right now nominal on the stent is what, guys? 12. So we're going to go up, and again, we're going to watch for pain. Go up here. So we're going to go up slowly. And you can see here as it goes up, I guess Dr. Kapoor is going up really slowly. <laughs> the, the unique thing about this covered graft, covered stent, is that 
uh, as PK said, that you can really move That's good. Uh, different parts of the stent to different diameters, which is unique in a covered stent environment. So it's a, it's a pretty slick device, and we've used it a couple times as well to a good effect. Actually, for chimneys, this is a great, this is a great um, stent. And I think there are a couple other advantages, Bill. The sizes, you, now we have a different size uh -huh. matrix, so we can use larger stents with shorter lengths. And as pump. PK mentioned, it's more flexible than what pump. we're used to. So it's, it's got there advantages. Right there you go. So now we're just going to uh, sheet the balloon, as they say, to get into that stent so we have full control. God forbid we have a perf or anything like that. Walk it out, Dr. Michelle. So now, just for anticoagulation-wise, so everybody knows, our ACT is uh, around 300 plus. The <coughs> reason we did 300 plus was because of the fact that we, we're going to have to deal with uh, the, uh, uh, the sheet, and obviously it's a live case. So we, normally our ACTs aren't this high, but we did keep it high this time. So now we're just going to take a, a picture. Our, our sheet has slipped out. But he has, uh, he has good pressure, and the patient is very, very stable. I'm just going to flush our sheath and make sure we don't have, have tracked any air. And now we, we, we're probably going to have to post-dilate that distal edge uh, to see how, how this, um, how this uh, stand is opposed. Flush forward. So. You know, Sir? Prakash, that you're doing a great job with the anchor like uh, Vishal around your neck. It's very, <laughs> very nicely done. <laughs> Inject. One of my fellows. So I now you can see we have we have flow in the lima again. We have good flow in the lima. So now the issue becomes is whether we need to even post dilate the stent. I I wouldn't do this. I'm but sorry, sir. It's a perfect results so that uh, if you go with a balloon there, you may have a dissection there, and then you have a big problem. Inject. And this would be great now to have a, a, a second access uh, to measure the pressure gra gradient. Uh, because what? if you don't have any pressure gradient, mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessary to post-dilate. But, but my question, Dr. Beeman, you know, is I, I could probably put a catheter across this and measure a pressure. Yeah. Uh, you know, our blood pressures are 121 over 64 now. Uh, he's sedated. He's more comfortable. He's uh, sleeping. So I'm going to actually just put a, I could even float a pressure wire across it and just do a pullback uh, if you'd like to see what it is and compare it to the sheath. So why don't you guys just give me a catheter. We'll just do a poor man's pressure wire and what? we'll just show that, uh, whether we need to do anything. But I have a real important question for the panel. Um, when you have a CT measurement, so now my distal, just proximal to that uh, thyrocervical trunk, uh, <coughs> it measured 10. So now I've deployed this coverage 10 at eight. So why should I not go ahead and post dilate that uh, uh, when I have a CT measurement that, uh, that it's 10? So people uh, present themselves in all different hemodynamic states. Was your CT scan a gated CT scan to measure this artery during systole or diastole? Uh, was it a gated CT scan? I, I believe it was. It was a cardiac CT that initially made the diagnosis, yes. It, so, was, uh, it was gated, yes. And so you, uh, you measured it during systole or diastole? I, I don't know. I can't yeah. tell you, but I'm, uh, Dr., Dr. Majid is saying so, yes, so, so I'm, so I'm assuming anyway, it's so true. So people come in different states. I would use uh, today, uh, if you have issues with measurements really? on this, you probably should do some sort of imaging today and not whichever day you uh, did the CT. Would Got a co-pilot, guys? Well, and, uh, you know, the CT measurements are going to be dependent on whether you're truly Volume axial loaded, to or perpendicular to the, to the yeah. vessel. Wire up. And so it, it may just have been an error in measurement, or you maybe you're measuring the adventitial, uh, to adventitial diameter. I mean, but I can tell you this patient is volume Advanced? deplete today, and they were volume loaded mm -hmm. at a normal Uvolemic. I'll be shocked, I'll be shocked for Kosh if that has no, we'll any gradient. Yeah, okay. So, PK, I th this is Mike Beckerick. I think it looks we'll great. It. I guess the question is, um, <clears throat> rather than a pressure wire, why don't you, you know, would you consider an IVIS to look and make certain that the stent is fully opposed? I, 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 we find <laughs> lots of discrepancies. We do a fair amount of endografts. We use IVIS in all those cases, and we compare the CT and IVIS, and often the CT measurements are a bit off. So, I'm, I'm not sure. You have a, what looks like a really nice result. You're what you've accomplished physiologically is you've got that Lima open now. You know, um, I'd be Zero. reluctant to go back. You know, the enemy of good is better. I, you know, Mike, it's funny you said that because we, we initially wanted to IVIS this lesion to uh, correlate it with the CT. And we were, we were concerned with the, uh, with the actual pullback because we were worried we were going to prolapse the sheath because of the tortuosity of the aorta and the difficulty in the groin. 
But here I've got now a pressure of 140 when before we had a pressure of rushing pressure of 85 to 90 distally. And, and so uh, we're just going to switch it. If you could show the pressure here, guys, to them. What we'll do is we'll just switch it right to the sheet. Switch it to the sheet now. Well, you can see it. Yep, now we're just there. going to switch it right to the sheet. Nice and we're just going to show you, like I said, a poor man's IVIS uh, or a poor man's uh, pressure wire. And we're going to pull back and we're going to see how this looks. Flush forward. Okay, and it's both been zeroed, so let's see here. Okay, stop. Zero. Zero, guys. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's really minimal, if anything. And I'm going to try, I mean, um, and we could, we could actually, it's actually the same pressure, so we have no, no pressure gradient at all. Yeah. So the question is, uh, uh, Mike, in, with the coverage stand, how would an IVIS help us? Would we be able to see the expansion or, or, or the lack, lack thereof? Give me a Spartacore. Well, that's a, you know, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I think that the, we've, we've typically done IVIS when we do stent grafts before, obviously, we put the graft in and sure. then can correlate it with the CT. And again, frequently, they don't match. And again, it depends on where you measure. You know, if it's intima to intima versus the, the vessel wall itself. You have a d densely calcified vessel, though, here. And um, if you're, ex and I would believe that if you, the IVIS would demonstrate whether you're fully expanded to your eight millimeters, which is the size of the stent that you chose. Right. So at least then you wouldn't know that you've under-expanded the stent that you've placed. Well, we will definitely try. What we're going to do very quickly is, no, you don't have to worry about the tip. We're going to just try to do an IVIS quickly. Walk this back, guys. And uh, I know we're, we're lacking a little time. Hopefully the IVIS tracks, but it should be able to track for sure. And I'd, I'm going to take a picture here before I do the IVIS of the ostium, just to see what you guys think. We, didn't fe we felt that CT-wise, ready for picture? CT-wise, the ostium wasn't involved. Ready for picture? And we were not planning on treating the ostium. Go ahead. Your measurements on the ostium on the CT were what? Six, seven? Six? Six. Uh, it was actually six, seven. Six point seven. And so you can see that your stent is larger than the ostium right now. Right. There. So now we're just going to send the IVIS up and very quickly we be done with this case. Prakash, the, the, the question you have to answer is uh, what are you going to do with the data that you get from the IVIS? If you have malaposition uh, in the distal edge, are you going to do anything about it? Do you have any data that restenosis or thrombosis is going to be increasing this large vessel? You know, we know the coronary vasculature is important, but in this uh, post dilatation question to answer is if uh, not doing anything is going to cause any, any problems later on. You know, uh, Jose, I, I, think, I think what we're going to do is, I think it's a great question, what we're going to do is, I, I, I feel very comfortable with this, uh, with this VBX stent. I mean, I think the stent is going to give me a lot of confidence in being able to post-dilate it without a problem. So, so <coughs> if I need to post-dilate it, I'm actually, I know how, how much it's going to shrink. I know what the shrinkage is going to be. And I also know that I can post-dilate it selectively, either the proximal or the distal. So it gives me that kind of advantage to do. So therefore, now here's the IVIS right now. I'm just going to pull it back. And we know that uh, we're just doing this more for the stent. So I'm just going to come back towards the stent and see whether it's, uh, the stent is an aid or not, and whether as we enter the stent we see anything. There, you see it's a little, little underexpanded, it looks like, okay. right at the ostium. And now you can see, now you can't tell. But the stent is clearly what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it looks like. The stent is expanded to a seven uh, distally. And I think proximately as we come out, I'm going to leave it. Okay, what's it look like at the ostium? I'm sorry, sir? What's it look like at the ostium? I, I, can, I, I can go back in and show you the IVIS of the ostium. One second. Yeah, I think the PTFE has air in it when it's initially introduced, so it's hard to see through it to, in the middle of the stent there. So right there is your ostium. You can see there's the stenting ending, and there's the, uh, there's the pro proximal ostium. We missed the ostium, and now we're back in the sheath. That looks good. Yeah. So, leave I can, it. Looks good. So what do, what do you guys think? Leave it or leave post dilate? Leave I, I, I leave suppose it. that leave uh, it. you make a, a great job. In my opinion, you should leave it uh, <laughs> uh, before, <coughs> before you may have a, a problem. Yeah. Leave, I, before you dissect the vertebral <coughs> IMA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're, we're going to leave it. And uh, we'll just, as you said, we'll just take, we took the final pictures. So I'm just going to show you the final picture of where we were. And, um, and, and you can clearly see here that, uh, whoops, sorry, that we have, a, we have a nice result and the IVA showing 
a well-expanded stand, and also you can see here that the lima is open as well in the last shot. So I think we've resolved the problem with anterior ischemia, and I, and I think uh, we're going to stop here and follow your great advice. Nice job, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you.